I do not understand myself to be an activist as such. I look at myself as a responsible citizen, someone who cares about the way the country is going. I am primarily a writer and filmmaker and I look at social issues in my writing and in my screenplays. And so it was quite normal for me to be interested in the goings-on of society around me. I started demonstrating in response to what was happening around the COVID pandemic in Zimbabwe. So I had been out quite a number of times before the 31st of July. I've been writing professionally for three decades and more now. It has been such a struggle to write and to get people to understand where I am coming from as a writer and what I am talking about. Being shortlisted for the Booker Prize 2020 was an amazing moment in my career and I just have a much higher profile as a writer. And the other thing is I feel more confident in myself. It is a relief when you arrive at 9 Walsh Road where Widow Riley lives without bumping into any acquaintances. You sit down on the drain bridge by the fence to squash your feet back into your pumps. Lips are all you see to begin with, and you are terrified. Swollen feet wedged into your lady dies, you leap up. The lips are arranged in a snarl around yellow teeth. They belong to a small, shaggy-haired terrier. Yow, yow, the dog yelps, outraged at your presence. Who are you? A high-pitched voice trembles through the morning air. Ndiwe Ani, the woman repeats. She uses the singular, familiar form to address you. Since a person worth something is plural, where your value is concerned, this woman agrees with the dog. Now, I am writing a young adult dystopian speculative novel called Sai Sai and the Great Ancestor of Fire. It's about three young women at the end of school who are called to be world shifters by the ancestors. I'm writing this because I felt that there was a dearth of literature for young adults on the continent and in Zimbabwe that really speaks to the condition and the life that they experience. I want to write it in a way such that it emerges from African culture and it speaks to the way African cosmology configures the world. So engagement with the ancestors is something that people can understand. Um, I chose speculative fiction because it is fantasy. It gives me um, a lot of space and breadth to deal with issues. And it's dystopian because the situation in most of our countries is very negative. Um, we have difficult conditions that young people have to engage with. And these conditions come right from the top, the way power is used in our countries and we experience it right down to the bottom, which is how we live our lives. Are we able to eat? Are we able to wash ourselves with water and keep clean? And so I wanted to engage with these things in a way that young people can understand. It's too nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Making so films for a person like me is very difficult in Zimbabwe because one has to be attached to channels of resources. Making films takes a lot of money and you also need a lot of permissions and so you have to be uh, aligned to government in some way. And so if you are not aligned to government, it is very difficult to obtain funding and space to make films in Zimbabwe. However, things are changing. We see that there are calls for inclusivity and diversity in the film world and I think this is going to impact Zimbabwe also. And as a result of it, I have begun talking to people outside the country, really from all over the world, on the continent, England and the USA. And I, I do believe that I will be able to make my films 
sooner rather than later. And I've been writing scripts in all this time that I have not been able to make films. I have been writing scripts and working with young people. And so I, I have a wealth of stories that are just waiting for me to bring to the screen. The 31st of July was meant to be an enormous nationwide demonstration in Zimbabwe against corruption and other issues of misgovernance. So a couple of days before the demonstration, the government declared it illegal. I found it really atrocious that my right to demonstrate, which is guaranteed by the constitution, was being tampered with. And I felt that since I had been so vocal in support, of the demonstration and so I decided to go out anyway in spite of the government um, uh, call not to demonstrate. The way I see it is I was arrested because I had gone out to demonstrate when the government had banned a demonstration. We were not told when the police actually came to tell us to get into the riot vehicle. We were only told what you are doing is illegal. Well, the court case has been going on since the 1st of August because the day after the arrest we were taken to court. We were fortunate to be given bail and uh, since then we had to return for remand appearances about nine times so far. The conditions in prison were appalling. There was no running water, uh, there was no food, so unless you had someone to serve you 24 hours of the day, to run around and bring you drinking water and food to eat. You didn't get anything to eat at all. It, it was really shocking. One of the bathrooms had about an inch of water on the floor, but nothing in the systems. It was horrifying and I only saw that in one day. I wouldn't like to see more. So the court case is still pending and my next appearance would be on the 9th of February. I live in an environment where I was not able to practice my art and my craft, which meant that I had to use my creative energies for other things, for engaging with the situation as a citizen. That being the case, I'm glad that I am able to do the little things that I do. I think that what prompts me to undertake some kinds of actions is the same prompt that leads me to writing. This whole idea of imagination. Things do not have to be the way they are. They could be different. And I'm really hoping that I can get more support for my creative narrative production because that really is who I am.